Stephanie Smiley, the interim state health officer and administrator of the DHS Division of Public Health, and Major General Paul Knapp of the Wisconsin National Guard. We'll begin the briefing with remarks from Stephanie Smiley. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. My name is Stephanie Smiley and I'm Wisconsin's interim state health officer and the administrator of the Division of Public Health. And I'll be starting with the numbers for our media briefing. And unfortunately, it's not the news that I wanna share with you all. Today, there are 1,117 new confirmed cases of COVID-19. That brings our total confirmed cases in Wisconsin to 44,135. Our total number of deaths is now 859, which is an increase of 13. This is the largest uh, single day increase in new cases Wisconsin has ever seen. And it's a good reminder that each of us needs to do all we can to stop the spread. We can stay at home as much as possible. We can practice physical distancing when we have to go out. We can wear a mask or a cloth face covering and we can wash our hands for at least 20 seconds. We can get tested if we have symptoms or have been exposed to COVID-19. As a reminder, here are the symptoms you should watch out for. A cough, shortness of breath, fever, chills, sore throat, runny nose, muscle pain, headache, and the new loss of taste or smell. While these are the most common symptoms, some people also experience fatigue, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or abdominal pain. Again, if you're experiencing any symptoms or if you've been exposed to COVID-19, please access a test. It is one very important way you can help stop the spread of COVID-19. Thank you, and now I'll turn it over to Major General Knapp for an update on the Wisconsin National Guard. Thanks, Stephanie. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Major General Paul Knapp, Wisconsin's Adjutant General. It's always a pleasure to join you for this briefing and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you all today. We crossed a major milestone in the last few days with over a quarter million COVID-19 tests administered across the state. That's really an incredible number when you stop to think about it. Our troops continue their hard work across the state and more than 1,000 continue to support the state's efforts in the COVID-19 response. It's hard to put into words what a monumental lift this pandemic has been for our citizen soldiers and airmen. They make it look effortless, but let me tell you, it's been truly incredible effort behind the scenes and our troops have sacrificed a lot to help fill the state's needs since this all began. Our first troops reported to state active duty March 12th to support Wisconsin's response to the pandemic and they've been engaged every day since then in an effort to serve you, their fellow Wisconsin citizens, neighbors, families, coworkers, and friends. It hasn't been an easy road and the response has grown over time. And frankly, our state has asked a lot of our Wisconsin National Guard and our troops have risen to the challenge in every sense of the word. I simply cannot praise them enough. Many left their civilian employers to answer the state's call for help. Others put college plans on hold or even tried to do both simultaneously. All have worked long days and late nights, sacrificing time with family and loved ones. When this all began on March 12th, none of us knew where this would go or the role we would ultimately play. But our troops still volunteered uh, to help and they remain on the job as dedicated as ever. And they'll be here to support our state as long as needed. As Wisconsin National Guard citizens, soldiers, and airmen, we are, after all, your neighbors. We're invested in Wisconsin because we live and work in the same communities which we serve. We have two primary roles, serving both as the state's uh, first military responder during emergencies such as COVID. And of course, we also still have our federal mission where we can be called to deploy overseas as the primary combat reserve for the Army and Air Force. Since March 12th, we've peaked at more than 1,400 troops mobilized in direct support to the COVID-19 response, fulfilling a variety of roles ranging from the ongoing specimen collection mission to helping staff isolation facilities and man a warehouse moving critical PPE around the state. We simultaneously mobilized an additional 2,400 troops to work as poll workers during April's election and another 160 during the spring election in May. We've done all of that on top of the hundreds of Wisconsin National Guard members who continue to serve around the globe 
in places like Afghanistan, the Middle East, Ukraine, and the Horn of Africa. I'm just so proud of the admirable way in which our troops have responded and continue to respond. We always stand ready to serve this great state and nation because this is who we are and it's why we wear this uniform. Thank you. We'll now open it up to your questions. A reminder to maintain audio quality to please keep your phones on mute until it's time to ask your question. And we have time today for one question and a follow-up. And we'll begin this afternoon with Jonathan Neiser from NBC26. Jonathan? All right. I uh, just wanted to ask if uh, the National Guard anticipates uh, being called in any way to assist with uh, schools as they, uh, in some cases, attempt to reopen. Hello. In terms of schools, uh, that's a good question. We have not uh, been asked uh, at all yet to assist with uh, reopening of schools, but like any of the other missions that we hadn't uh, planned for uh, in terms of the COVID-19 response, we would be uh, ready, uh, willing, and able to help if that would become a uh, requirement uh, for opening up schools in the state. Have a follow-up, Jonathan? Okay, thank you. Moving on to Brandon Arbuckle from WISC-TV in Madison. Brandon? Again, Brandon Arbuckle from News 3. Okay, we'll move on then to Scott Bauer from the Associated Press. Scott. Hi, uh, thanks for doing the call today. Um, can you tell us how many um, tests there were uh, um, that came back negative for today and uh, where we were in percentage of positive tests? And also this, this new high number, the uh, 1,117, do you have any demographic information? Um, are we talking people in their 20s again, like we've seen in this recent spike? Is it a new population? Just a little more context on these numbers. Sure, all of our numbers are posted um, on our website at 2 p.m., um, but what I can tell you uh, right now that I have in front of me is that the negative uh, results that we added since yesterday's total is 13,371. Um, and then uh, in terms of the, the demographics, um, we are, uh, let's see. Um, I wouldn't necessarily have that information in front of me at this moment, but yes, we are definitely seeing increases um, in the, the younger populations that are testing positive. And a follow-up, Scott? If not, we'll move on then to Sean Kirkby from Wisconsin Health News. Sean? Again, Sean Kirkby from Wisconsin Health News. And a reminder to press star six to mute and unmute your phones. We'll move on to Denise Lockwood from Racine County I. Denise? Thanks for taking my call. What I wanted to really understand is um, the decision-making process. I know that uh, the Wisconsin National Guard um, have to be invited, but how does that that process actually work work with regards to the overall decision making with where they go and um, how much the the need is as far as determining where they go? Okay, uh, great question. Uh, so in terms of prioritizing testing and where the National Guard, uh, where we respond with our community test sites uh, has to do with uh, the priority level and what type of a test site require, is required. So uh, I'll give you an example. So we have uh, outbreaks uh, generally in like long-term care facilities, nursing homes, uh, congregate care facilities, that sort of thing. An outbreak in a facility like that would be a higher priority than a routine community testing site. So when all of these requests come into the State Emergency Operations Center uh, through Web EOC, through the county emergency managers, uh, every day our State Emergency Operations Center manager 
uh, uh, he basically puts all of those requests that have come in that day, and then they go to a policy group, uh, which is made up of the uh, the governor's staff, uh, DHS, uh, DOA, uh, State Emergency Operations Center, and DMA, which includes uh, the Wisconsin National Guard. Uh, and we have a meeting every day to go over those requests. Uh, and if we have to prioritize them in terms of timing, uh, then that's what we would do. And we would prioritize the more time critical uh, test sites uh, first in terms of scheduling. Uh, right now we have uh, the capacity to meet all of the demand out there uh, to test everyone who, who needs to get a test in terms of community-based testing. And so it does come down to a matter of just scheduling after that in terms of process. Thank you, Denise. Moving on to Shemaine Mills from Wisconsin Public Radio. Shemaine? May Mills from Wisconsin Public Radio. And we'll move on then to Stephanie Hoff from WIS Politics. Stephanie? Stephanie Hoff from WIS Politics. Okay, we'll move on then to Riley Viderkind from Wisconsin State Journal. Riley. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Um, my question is probably for Stephanie. Uh, if you could implement one or two statewide regulations to help deal with uh, this virus, uh, which would those be and why? I guess I'm thinking of, you know, if the legislature uh, were to come back at some point, what do you think would be, you know, a couple of the most important uh, statewide regulations that that would be uh, effective uh, to try to bring the numbers down? Thanks. Sure. Uh, it's a it's an interesting question uh, because, you know, I think that what we have, um, you know, understood throughout this response is that uh, in Wisconsin, a lot of the that decision making authority uh, has been at the local level. Right. And so we have seen across uh, the state that there's been advisories issued um, as well as requirements issued um, for masks and cloth face coverings. And we've also seen um, our business partners and our business communities um, really uh, also instituting their own policies um, you know, for their patrons and customers to help keep uh, not just their workers safe, but other people, um, you know, who may be uh, frequenting those those businesses and facilities. And I think that, you know, what I would say to, to that is that we, we have very few tools um, that are available to us uh, in order to, uh, you know, really slow the spread of this disease. And one of the ways to do that really is by wearing a, a, a cloth face covering um, and, and physical distancing. And so, um, you know, I think that any chance that, you know, folks can, uh, you know, do the, the thing that the responsible thing it is, you know, really, we, we believe that is the duty of people to uh, protect themselves, protect others um, by physical distancing and wearing a mask. And, um, you know, we certainly want people to, to make those, those choices. Um, and uh, that, that is the, the way uh, that we would uh, protect people. Thank you, Riley. Now to Molly Beck from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Molly? Hi, thanks for this call. Um, the Dane County Health Department is saying they are about 10 days behind in processing negative tests. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how many health departments in the state are experiencing a backlog like that of processing mm -hmm. negative tests and how that's affecting the daily percentage of positive mm -hmm. tests that's reported each day. Yeah, it's a it's a great question, actually. Um, and I would say that because, um, you know, of the, the numbers that we're seeing every day, you know, the the thousands of, of results that are reported to us, um, we are seeing backlogs. And, um, you know, and I would say that particularly, you know, counties that are getting harder are, you know, they're going to have you know, obviously, uh, where there's there's more results being reported, um, and there's uh, folks that um, you know need to process those results and have them inputted into um, our 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 surveillance system. And so, um, you know, there are definitely um, you know backlogs of of um, of data, but we those there are thousands upon thousands of of um, results processed each day. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I would say that that is 
that is a reality that is facing um, many local health departments. And to follow up, Molly? If not, we'll be- Yeah, could you- um, Oh, go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, could you tell me how the virus activity right now in the state compares to the virus activity in March when businesses and schools were shut down? Yeah, um, so the what I will say is that we're not really able to compare apples and oranges because the, you know, the tool that we currently have available, um, you know, and the, the metrics that we're using did not exist uh, in, in March. Uh, so we, we don't have a direct comparison. Um, but disease activity level across the state is definitely high. Um, and it is uh, high in most of the counties um, in our state. Um, and when, uh, you know, things were shut down, um, you can imagine that disease activity was much lower and we had many uh, lower, uh, at least lower spread uh, that we were able to uh, record because, uh, as you know, um, when you're out and about and things are open and people are gathering um, and we, you know, the science has since evolved, you know, about cloth face coverings, um, you know, there, it was, uh, you know, a, a different time and um, we, we're definitely seeing a higher disease transmission, higher disease um, activity now uh, than in March. And a lot of that, you know, can also be, uh, you know, seen when uh, through our contact tracing, many people are reporting um, more contacts now um, than they had been uh, back in March when uh, that contact tracing was happening. So, you know, they may have averaged, you know, three to five contacts. Um, and, you know, we're seeing, uh, you know, people who are reporting, you know, upwards of, you know, 15 to 20 contacts um, when they're being interviewed. So I would say, you know, that is, uh, we're definitely seeing higher activity um, and, you know, through many different metrics that we monitor. Thank you, Molly. Now to Courtney Garish from Spectrum News. Courtney? And a reminder, star six to unmute your phone, Courtney Garish from... Are you there, Courtney? Hello, can you hear me? Sorry. <laughs> yes, we can. Okay. Um, so I was jumping off the, the increase in cases that you're still seeing in the younger population, the positive cases, um, and then the hospital rates are now, you're seeing a really high average in those. Before, when the younger age group was starting to spike, the hospital rates and the death rates weren't going up because along the lines of the, the younger generations don't have the same type of severe illness, not as many deaths and not the severity of illness. So how do you correlate that now with the hospital rates going up? What is that indicative of? Sorry, took me a minute to get my, my unmute button. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think that, you know, what we're, we're seeing is that, uh, you know, definitely seeing more uh, patients hospitalized um, as, as we go. And I think that that's just sort of the, the unfortunately, the, the course of, of this illness, um, you know, people do become hospitalized and we start seeing the case numbers go up. You're, we're gonna anticipate that we're also going to see more hospitalizations. It does take a, there is a delay typically, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, between, you know, can be between the time that you are diagnosed um, you know, and, and end up needing, um, you know, additional care. So, um, you know, that I think that we're just seeing um, additional cases, which, uh, you know, we can anticipate, unfortunately, more, more hospitalizations as a result of this disease. And Courtney, do you have a follow-up? Um, I do. Switching to schools, a lot mm -hmm. of um, schools are going to be in session five days a week. Some are choosing mm -hmm. a combination of virtual and in classroom is there any way to prepare for or do you anticipate what kind of a spike we're going to see from that exposure sure i you know, it is actually really hard uh, to anticipate what we might see. And I think that that's part of uh, the challenge that we're faced with when, um, you know, trying to figure out uh, the, the best way forward um, with, with reopening schools. Um, you know, we, 
our department continues to work uh, with the Department of Public Instruction and local health departments, uh, you know, to provide guidance and recommendations for school districts. And, you know, and it's hard to, to sort of anticipate, well, what's what is the disease activity level going to be this fall? Um, you know, unfortunately, if we continue to see the trends that we're seeing right now, you know, it, it's not probably going to be in a good situation in the fall either. Um, you know, we have, have been and we continue to monitor and analyze the, the data to help uh, school boards and, and school administrators <laughs> to make decisions um, in consultation with their, their local uh, health partners. Um, but, you know, enough is not really known um, about, you know, transmission in schools, what that, um, you know, means to, to be able to really anticipate, um, you know, what the disease activity level is going to be as a result of, uh, um, you know, school coming back in, in the fall in some instances. So it is um, really a, a quandary to be sure. Um, and, you know, we obviously are, are going to need to, uh, you know, pay close attention um, this fall and, um, you know, make decisions accordingly. Thank you, Courtney. Now to Aaron Maben from Fox News Milwaukee, Fox 6 Milwaukee. Aaron? Hello, thank you for this call today. Um, really a follow-up to that question you just answered. Uh, what is your message to school districts and also school administrators and parents as we're learning more about these reopening plans right now? Yeah, I, I think that the, the, the bottom line is that, you know, we're continuing to work um, and it is really difficult again um, work to sort of anticipate what uh, the situation is going to be like in fall and understanding that decisions need to be made now about you know how people can proceed in the future so um, working with our, our colleagues and our partners um, at the Department of Public Instruction um, as well as uh, local health departments and you know school administrators to come up with a, the uh, you know the best plans that we can um, to help Help keep students um, and uh, their in, in, and teachers um, as as safe as they can throughout this is really the the goal. Um, we will again continue to to monitor um, the the situation and you know revisit you know uh, these conversations. You know I don't think that it is a, a situation where you would make a decision and be one and done because as you know we have done throughout the entire uh, response is that you learn as you go. Um, we have no playbook that has been written you know for this uh, disease or for this response. Certainly we can leverage you know pandemic plans and influenza um, you know lessons that we've learned you know from from those uh situations but this is very different um and it is uh something that we're just we're going to have to you know see how it goes and and learn um you know as as time goes on throughout this this pandemic so i think um what i would say is um you know just we have to keep talking we have to keep um you know monitoring um and and be willing to you know sort of come together and uh you know keep those lines of communication open and did you have a follow-up, Aaron? Yeah, do you have concerns about schools reopening in the state? I think that uh, my concern is, is focused on making sure that if local administrators and local health departments, you know, make the choice to open schools either partially um, or, or uh, you know, having a virtual option, you know, these are all things that uh, they've, you know, we've been working very closely with the de Department of Public Instruction um, to ensure that everybody has what they need in order to make the best decision for their community. Um, so I would say, you know, put the trust into the, those local decision makers um, and, you know, and certainly, um, you know, the, the people, um, you know, on a individual level you know they will be making choices about you know what is best for themselves and and their children um you know come fall thank you thank you aaron now to wkow tv in madison emily or danny hi thanks for taking our calls um and our questions um, I wanted to ask about um, the demographic. You said you were still seeing increases in younger populations. Is there a particular, um, when you're doing the contact tracing with um, some of these people who are in the new cases, is there one or two or, or more places or things that they've been doing 
you know, last time we kind of talked, it was, you know, they had been involved in a mass gathering or they had gone to a party or something like that, or they had been at a bar or restaurant. Is there a reason, I guess, um, this time, or is it kind of the, the same what we had been seeing before, that they've been out and about in, in public or in a large group of people? Do you know that? Yeah, I would say that is um, that is continuing to be the trend um, where we are hearing about people who had attended uh, gatherings, social gatherings, um, and you know, and and I think that those are really continuing to be the the drivers, um, you know, that we're seeing through our our contact tracing efforts. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't think much has changed uh, since we uh, discussed on this last week. Do you have a follow up, Danny? Okay. With that, um, we'll go back to some callers that uh, were unable to uh, contact. I did have a follow-up. I think somebody muted me again. Please go ahead. Hello. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, how worried are you, um, you know, with these, these numbers as we're seeing? And you said this is the largest single-day increase that Wisconsin has ever seen. Uh, is this concerning to you or are, are is is DHS not as worried as we talk about, um, you know, schools, some of them reopening? No, I, I think that it is a cause for concern. Um, you know, this is, uh, you know, where the trend is going in the wrong direction. We want to see decreases in the number of cases each day. Um, and it is, you know, the, as the uh, administrator for the Division of Public Health and State Health Officer, it is it is my job to ensure that, you know, we are doing what we can um, to uh, prevent and um, control the spread of disease. Uh, you know, I think that we we really um, you know are continuing to encourage people um, you know to physically distance and uh, wear their their cloth face coverings and and you know honestly we we do need people to um, you know not do the the social gatherings um, you know and and if they must go out you know please maintain that distance um, but that you know we the trend is not going in the right direction um, and uh, you know I I think that you know we're obviously monitoring the hospital capacity as well. Um, you know, that is that is something that, uh, you know, if we begin to see um, more and more of uh, cases and the hospitalizations uh, go up, that is cause for concern, um, as we've seen throughout other places in the country um, where the capacity for the ability to actually uh, treat people or, or care for people um, you know, as it, you know, may become diminished, you know, that is uh, obviously a scenario that that we do not want to see in our state. So we're really hoping that, uh, you know, people will uh, try to, uh, you know, make some changes in terms of, of their, their behavior and, and really ensuring that they're doing their part to stop the spread. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll now go back to the reporters we weren't able to connect with earlier, beginning with uh, Brandon Arbuckle from News 3 in Madison. Brandon? And a reminder, star six to unmute your phone. Brandon Arbuckle. Okay, moving on then to Sean Kirkby from Wisconsin Health News. Sean. Hi, I'm sorry I, I, I missed that earlier. Um, I had a, a, for the surge facility in Milwaukee, um, has that been utilized at all yet? And what's the future of that facility? Thank you. Great question. Um, we don't get to talk about that much, um, which is good, uh, but it is, uh, it's still there. Um, and, you know, we still plan to have that on hand um, for, uh, you know, as an alternate care facility uh, in the event that we uh, need to use it. Um, and, and, you know, that is uh, planning that, uh, you know, we have to be prepared uh, in the event that uh, we, we need other places um, to care for people. And a follow up, Sean? Uh, yeah, um, there was uh, there are plans for a, a facility in Madison as well. Are, are those plans? I know they are put on hold. Are they being reassessed or, or are you planning to move forward with that at all? Thank you. 
Sure. I, my understanding is that that um, is still on hold. Um, and again, you know, we would need to reassess that should we see the, the trends, um, you know, go in a direction where we might anticipate a, a need in the, the Dane County area. But so far, my understanding is that those conversations are still on hold. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Sean. Uh, Shemaine Mills from Wisconsin Public Radio. Shemaine? Wisconsin Public Radio? Once again, star six to unmute your phones. Moving on then to Stephanie Hoff from WIS Politics. Stephanie? And again, Stephanie Hoff. Well, with that, that concludes today's briefing. Please continue to monitor the DHS COVID-19 web pages for data and guidance. Additional information can be found on the websites of the Governor, the Department of Workforce Development, the Department of Public Instruction, the Department of Children and Families, and Wisconsin Emergency Management. Be safe and have a good afternoon.